This is the Global Mom Show, Episode 4. Hi, I'm Mary Grace Otis, and you're listening to The Global Mom Show. Do you love to travel, learn about other cultures, or open your home to people from around the world? Maybe you live and work abroad. Maybe you used to, or maybe you wish you did now. Maybe you live in a big city with lots of opportunities for global connection, or maybe you live in a small town like I do, and you want to find ways to connect yourself and your kids with a global view of life. Well, whatever the case, The Global Mom Show will encourage and inspire you to live a global life wherever you are and teach your kids to do the same. Each week, I'll connect you with moms around the world who are living globally-minded lives as educators, authors, immigrants, expats, development workers, business owners. Well, you get the idea. I can't wait to share their stories with you and to hear yours as well. Here we go. Today, we welcome Lisa Webb to the show. Lisa is the blogger behind the Canadian expat mom.com. You can also find her stories of expat life and parenting on Huffington Post and Scary Mommy. She lived in France for the past five years and recently relocated to Indonesia. On her blog, she writes about everything from raising kids to being married to culture shock. There's something there for expats and non-expats alike. And she's just released a new children's book, which we'll talk about today. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. First of all, tell me a little bit about your family and where you're living now. My husband and I both come from Canada. My husband's from the French part of Canada. I am very much not from the French part of Canada, as I discovered when I moved to France. But yes, we were both living in Calgary, Alberta. Neither one of us were from there, but that's where we were living. And my husband got offered a job to move to Paris. So we decided to do that. And now we have two daughters who were both born in France. And where are you living now? Now we live in Borneo, Indonesia, which is a very long way from France and a very long way from Canada. Yes, it is. And you were in France for five years. How long do you plan on being in Indonesia? That's not always up to us. It's just because of uh, my husband's work. So we were there for five years. We were one year in Paris and then four years in the south of France. And when we were asked to come to Indonesia, we thought that it would be for two or three years. And we quickly found out just because of things that were happening within the company that it would only be one year that we will be here. So we'll be moving again this summer. We just don't know where to yet. Is there any chance you'll be going back to Canada or is everything going to be an overseas assignment? Um, most likely overseas. Okay. Let's talk first impressions. What are some of your first impressions of Indonesia thus far? The first day, the first impression was clearly that it was very hot. We were just all sweating all the time. (laughs) Because, I mean, in the south of France, it's hot. In the summertime, it gets very warm. But here, it was extremely hot. We tell people back home they have two temperatures here. It's hot and really, really hot. Yeah. (laughs) That was our first impression. And also that people were very friendly. People are in Indonesia very friendly. And that we're clearly not from here was our other impression because Mm -hmm. we got a lot of looks and a lot of people just interested in what we were doing, even if it was only buying groceries. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you stand out a lot? To say the least, yes. I have yeah. hair and I have two fair-haired daughters with blue eyes. And yes, we most definitely stand out a lot. There's no question about that. Have you been able to explore a little bit yet? Uh, we have a little bit. My husband and I actually, before we knew we would be moving here, obviously, we decided to come to Indonesia for our honeymoon seven years ago now. So when we were on our honeymoon, we went to Bali and Lombok. And when we came back here, we actually took the kids back to Bali. And they had a great time there. And this past weekend, actually, we just went exploring in Samboja to see the orangutans. And 
that was an experience in itself because <laughs> having a two-year-old and a four-year-old, um, you don't always know how they're going to react to different situations. So mm-hmm. one of our daughters loved the orangutans and one of our daughters very much did not love the orangutans. <laughs> So. How close were you to the orangutans? How did that work? Well, we stayed in a kind of like a treehouse lodge there for the weekend. And we got to go and they bring they brought us right to see where they lived and watch a feeding. They were kind of on like a little island. So there was a river that runs between where the orangutans are and where we were. And orangutans don't swim. So that was... There was no fence or anything, but there was just a little river between us and them. So we were quite close, but not in fear of, you know, being taken away by orangutans. Mm -hmm. Now, is this a rescue for orangutans? Yeah, it's a rehabilitation center. It was really interesting. I'm hoping to eventually get around to writing about it on the blog because we had a really great experience and took some good videos and things. But yeah, they do really good work there, and it's privately run, not government funded. So, the, my the reason I found out about it is because my daughter's school often does fundraising and things like that that gets sent to the rescue center. So, on this show, I talk to moms from around the world about how they live globally minded lives wherever they are. Were you always interested in travel or in living overseas, or is this something that sprung up in the last few years? I always enjoyed traveling as a child. We didn't do very many really big trips, but when we did travel as a family, it was something that I really looked forward to. I was excited about it. And I didn't start traveling on my own very much until I was finished university. And some of my girlfriends decided they were going to temporarily move to London, England and do some substitute teaching there. And I thought, why not? I'll go with you. So during my time living in London, I was able to travel to many different countries in Western Europe, and that sort of sparked something in me. When I went back to Calgary and was teaching, I would use my holidays. So I always had time off at Easter, where I would go to different countries in Central America. One year I went to Belize, one year I went to Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. And then because I was a teacher and I had the summer off, I often use those summers to do teacher-based traveling. So I taught one summer in South Korea. The next summer I went to Peru and I went to India. So it's always been something that I was really passionate about. And then when I, went my, when I met my husband, he was also a traveler. So that was something that kind of brought us together. And we've just kept doing that as a family because it's been just a natural progression for us. Did the two of you talk about living overseas when you guys were dating? Is that something that you saw in your future? Absolutely not. Um, It was mentioned (laughs) to me that because my husband worked for a French company, there was a possibility of moving to France. And I thought, well, I don't want to do that. That's not something that I want. Mm -hmm. really happy in my life here. I have a good job. I have lots of friends. My family lived close by. I... And I actually felt that way until three months after we lived in Paris. <laughs> um, so the, the transition was hard for me. As much as I loved traveling, I also loved the life that I had in Canada. And it, traveling permanently or being an expat was not something that was a plan that I had. So take me back to that first decision to move to France. For some people, that initial uprooting is the most challenging. And it sounds like it was that way for you. After that, some people seem to be more comfortable moving to new places. Was the decision-making process like that for you and your husband? Absolutely. The first move was the hardest one because that's when I had to resign from my job. I had to, well, I was a stay-at-home mom with no kids at that point. We didn't have any children and I didn't work because I didn't speak the language. And I didn't have any friends in the country where, that we lived in. and. I didn't know anyone. I had no family. And at that point, I, I don't think, I think that was the first time that I got a smartphone. That's how long we've been out of Canada. And mm-hmm. so I didn't have WhatsApp and FaceTime. I've just, it was, it was a really hard transition for me at that point. 
But once we moved from Paris to the south of France, it was far easier because that first initial adjustment had already been made. So I had Mm -hmm. already quit my job. I had already been away from my family. I was getting used to the culture. So that transition was easier. And then again, coming to Indonesia was also, you didn't have to make those initial steps. You, you understood the process a little bit more. You understood what you needed to do to get settled in. Mm -hmm. Now, how has the transition been for your husband? Because he, you said he's from the French speaking part of Canada. Is that correct? Yes, that is. For him in Paris, I would say that there was very little transition at all because he was already working for a French company in Canada. So the only thing that he might have had was a a French Canadian accent, which I think seven years later after working for the company that he does, it maybe is wearing off a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that was the only difference for him. There was no language barrier. He, his job was the same coming to Indonesia, maybe a little bit more. However, he is with the same company. So there is that, that, Sameness, I guess you could say. Continuity, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and what about your daughters? You know, they were born in France. Um, and how, how has that affected their lives being bicultural or well, third culture kids? For my daughters, we were more concerned about our older daughter who was four when we moved here because when you're two, as long as you have your mom and your dad, you're pretty happy and you don't really notice that much of a difference. But our older daughter had already started school in France and she had made some friends and we, we thought she would be okay because our kids travel a lot. So they're used to being in different places and adapting to different culture and food and just general scenery. And it was actually not as difficult as we thought. We got here and we didn't know if she was going to want to just stay at home with us for a little while, but we had been in Indonesia less than 24 hours and she was already ready to go to her new school and she had her backpack on. So the first day that we got here, she went to school and I think that because she goes to a French international school, that's been a lot easier for her because the language hasn't changed and Mm -hmm. In a way, she fits in more here than she did in France because in France, a lot of her friends went to English-speaking international schools, but because our family spoke French at home, we sent our daughter to a local French school. So she was a little bit of the foreign student. Even though she was born in France, she had a mom who was clearly not from France. But now, being in Indonesia... All the kids in her school are from France, which is where she's from, too. So when all the kids talk about, oh, I I was born in France, well, our daughter says, oh, so was I. So Mm -hmm. all of her friends still speak French. They it's the same songs that they learn in the school. It's uh, the transition has been easier for her. If we move back to Canada one day, maybe that's when she'll experience a little bit more culture shock, I think. Mm -hmm. Now. How are you raising your children bilingually? How does that, what does that look like in your house? For us, it's, it's pretty straightforward and it just comes naturally. But for anyone who actually comes into our house and sits down and has dinner with us, it, it might be a little bit different because I speak to our kids in English. They speak back to me in English. My husband speaks to them in French. They speak back to him in French. My husband and I speak English together and our daughters speak French together, which might to each sound, other. Yes. Which might sound a little bit confusing, but it's so natural for the kids because that's just how it's always been since they were babies, since they were born. So it it's kind of a unique situation, but doing it that way, they have learned that When someone speaks French to them, they speak French back. And when someone speaks English to them, they speak English back. So it's, I'm quite proud of them for that because it comes to them far more naturally than it does for me. Well, it's great, really. I mean, I know so many people want to teach their children a second language and 
it's difficult to make that a pattern in your life. My husband and I both speak German and right now it's kind of our secret language (laughs) (laughs) when we don't want the kids to know what we're talking about. Like, okay, we got to get out of here or (laughs) (laughs) the kids need to go to bed now or (laughs) something like that. But, um, uh, which is unfortunate because they have not been able to pick up on so much. Um, but that sounds, I mean, it sounds like a, a typical way that a lot of bilingual couples do it. And um, it's really neat that you've been able to carry that through. Um, what about your language exposure in Indonesia? How is that working? Are you trying to learn some of the local language? Do you have to use it on a regular basis? Um, well, to be honest, I started trying to learn the language as soon as we got here. Uh, I was gung-ho when I started with Indonesian lessons. And then I quickly found out we weren't going to be here for as long as we thought. And because I was taking Indonesian lessons, and I also was taking French lessons, because there is an Alliance Francaise here. So Mm -hmm. I still need to work on my French because for as long as we are within this company, it's French-based. So our entire community is from France. My husband speaks to our kids in French. So that's still very much a part of our life. And I still could use some improvement in my French. So I decided to continue with my French lessons. And also because the people who, the local people who we have the most contact with, which is a very, it's a whole nother story, but we do have some help in our house, which was a big adjustment for us. And they actually speak French as their second language. So they speak Indonesian and they speak French just because they've been working with French families for so long. So Mm -hmm. I'm not even speaking English with the the help that is in our house. So I've, I've picked up a little bit of Bahasa Indonesian, but mostly I have enough trouble juggling my second language. And how does that feel for you to be, you know, the one person, or I'm sure there's others, but to you, it might feel like you're the one person that doesn't speak French, um, as fluent perhaps as other people. How, how does that affect your experience within your family and within, you know, the expat community that you're in? Well, within my family, it's okay. It's normal because my husband and I speak English together, but he might feel overwhelmed some days because, there are days when he's the only person that I have to speak English with and he comes home and I just kind of unload my day on him because I haven't had a chance to do it with anyone else. I haven't had little chitter chatter with my girlfriends throughout the day. I am actually the only Anglophone in our, in our camp. We call it a camp. It's kind of, it's like a, a community. It's not really a compound, but I'm the only Anglophone that's here. So at times that, that's a big adjustment for me. It can be a bit isolating, but my French is good enough that I can get by. Mm -hmm. And I just don't feel really confident in huge groups of people to, to take over the conversation like I might do in English. Right. Do you feel that speaking in another language affects your personality? Absolutely. I'm far more funnier. I like to think in English than I am in French, but It also stretches you in a way that when we were living in France and I do get the opportunity to make a joke and people actually laugh and I'm doing that in another language, I'm so proud of myself. I just, it makes you feel so good. You think, wow, I can actually do this. I'm, I'm getting by, I'm more than just getting by. It's more than traveler's French. I can actually communicate, but yes, it does. I'm not as outgoing as in French as I am in English. Yeah. It, I feel like when I speak German, it's, it's a little bit of a different side coming out. So I, you know, I haven't, I haven't been over there in a while, so I haven't spoken it in a while, but it is, it's a, it's a challenge. So, so how would you say the, uh, the adjustment for you in Indonesia is different than France as far as culture shock or, um, just you said you were more prepared for this adjustment, perhaps. Um, yes, because 
Well, my job went from being a teacher or an assistant principal to having no job. And now the blog has kind of opened up this world of writing to me. So I'm able to work from home. So if I'm writing children's books, I'm doing that from France or I'm doing that from Indonesia. That doesn't really change for me. So I don't think coming to Indonesia, we had much culture shock more than cultural we had more cultural adjustments so and yeah what would some of those be for example um indonesia is a muslim country in france there's no such thing as having a skirt that's too short (laughs) so we come here and it's 40 degrees and the sun is blazing and i inside of our camp here our compound you can you can basically wear whatever you want. So sometimes I'll be in shorts and a tank top and then I'll just run out to the grocery store forgetting that I'm leaving the camp and I walk into the supermarket with a tank top that has my bra strap showing a little bit and I'm just horrified. I, I basically, it would be the equivalent to walking into a grocery store at home with no top on. Or at least that's how I feel. I just, I feel very naked and... I'm not used to that aspect of things having to cover up a little bit more. And, you know, it's date night with my husband. There's no holding hands there. It's just, you have to be just more culturally sensitive. So now to adjust to things like that, for example, I keep a a shawl or a, a pashmina scarf in the glove box of our car. So that if I do go out forgetting what I'm wearing, I can always, wrap that around myself just to feel a little bit more covered. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, that's part of the fine line that we have to play if you're going to be in a different culture or traveling or things like that is, you know, what's acceptable and what is really supporting the culture that you're in and respecting that culture. And sometimes, you know, we make the wrong judgment call. And sometimes, you know, we push the limits too far. And other times we just say, well, this is what I have to do um, in this situation. But I think there's lots of different situations that come up. And that's a good example for us. Now, I have three boys and we just made a long trip from northern Michigan down to Florida, which was a big undertaking, to say the least. And that was driving in a car. Now you have traveled with your little ones, Lisa, throughout France, Vietnam, and now in Indonesia. And I'm sure that you are asked this question all the time, but how do you manage overseas travel with two little ones? Well, for us, because we are expats, my kids don't actually know any different. If we wanted them to see their family, we needed to travel overseas. So the first time My oldest daughter went overseas. She was eight weeks old. We took her home for Christmas. And it obviously it was a huge, big, scary experience the first time. And thinking back to have one eight-week-old baby in a baby carrier, well, that now seems like a dream opposed to... Easy, yeah. (laughs) That's always how it is, but you don't know at the time and you have to go through it. And I remember... Again, when we were living in in France, I had a one-year-old or one-and-a-half-year-old on my lap because she didn't even have her own airplane seat yet. And I was five months pregnant, and I was flying back home. So I had a pregnant belly with a toddler on my lap by myself for an overseas trip. And I thought, I am never going to do this again. (laughs) But you go back home, and you forget about it, and you want to see your family. So... It's just something that we always did. And being in Europe, we wanted to travel as much of Europe as we could. And we wanted to take advantage of our location. And I was just writing something the other day, and I actually counted how many countries my four-year-old daughter had been to. And I think we were up around 26 or 27 different countries. Wow. So I think for her, that's it's an amazing experience to be able to give that to our children And although at times it can be challenging, it's just something that it's part of our family. It's part of who we are. Some people like to go skiing. Some people 
have a camp and they like to go fishing and always be out on the lake. Well, our family likes to travel. That's our thing. So we just continue to do it and we make the best of the situations we're in. We might not be able to do the things that we would if it were just the two of us traveling. We're not hiking up the side of a mountain or anything like that, but we're still experiencing the culture and we're bringing the kids and they're interacting with local people. And it's just, it's been a pretty neat experience for us. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Lisa has written a new children's book. I just got my copy in the mail today and I have to tell you, it is adorable. The title is The Kids Who Travel the World and this one is set in Paris, France. So Lisa, tell us, how did you get the idea for this book and why did you decide to write it? I think the idea stemmed from, well, I'm a mom and I'm a teacher. And even though I'm not teaching anymore, that's still a very big part of me. And I love to travel. So it kind of, it was just a natural progression that came together that I wanted to write a book about kids traveling, but I wanted it to be a little bit education based. So the book, it does have a little bit of, it has a storyline, but you're also learning about the place that the book takes place in while you're reading it. So if a family is going to take a trip to Paris, they can buy this book for their children before they go to get them excited about it, to learn about the place that they're going to be at. So those landmarks are a little bit more meaningful for the kids if they know about them before they get there. And for me, I also wanted a way to, it's kind of like documenting some of our travels that we've done because the kids in the book are actually my two daughters. So all the places that I'm going to be writing about are places that we've actually been to visit. That was my next question. Where will the next location be? The next location is in the works. It's almost finished actually. And it is taking place in Rome because I have a a very strong passion for all things Italian. So Italy is my favorite country in the world. So Rome was next. And then there's another book coming up that's quite self-indulgent because (laughs) I'm doing, I'm going to start writing also not only internationally, but about places in Canada and what better place to start than my hometown of Thunder Bay, Ontario. So it's not the biggest place in Canada, but that's a little bit of a passion project for me. And that's going to be my first book in Canada. So how many of these books do you plan on writing? Will you just continue until you get all the locations that you've hit? That would be like (laughs) 27 locations. I don't know if I'll be able to do all the locations, but I'm going to continue with it for as long as I can or as long as I continue to enjoy doing it. Lisa also has another book coming out in June. Lisa, tell us about your new book, Once Upon an Expat. This is an anthology. So it's a collection of stories from authors from around the world because it's called Once Upon an Expat. So it's stories of other expats like myself who've packed up their life and decided to live in a foreign country, whether it's for a long time or a short time. There's some people who have been on expat for 25 years and have lived in 15 different countries. And there's some people who write about being on their first experience. So I'm just in the process. I've collected all the stories and editing them. But I'm finding it fascinating to read these stories because I'm obviously not the only person who has done this, moving their life and moving again. And I'm getting stories from families and people in anywhere from like the Netherlands and France to Congo and Kazakhstan and Chile and Libya. And the stories are just, they're so entertaining. It's There's nothing boring about them. So I'm loving reading them. Now, I want to ask you what the word expat means to you. That's a title that, you know, it's kind of thrown around for lots of different reasons. How does that title affect your perception of yourself? That's a good question. I think that for me, having lived away from the country that I grew up in 
has made me more of a citizen of the world, not just a citizen of Canada. Um, you're able to identify with another country and another culture that you would never before really have the full experience. Like you can visit somewhere on vacation. Like for example, you mentioned we, our family just came back from Vietnam at Christmas and we got to, to spend time there and we ate the food and, and interacted with the people. But it, it's different than when you live somewhere, when you actually live there every day, you really, you, you kind of chameleon yourself and you become one of, one of the people who are there, even though you're not truly from that country, you get an experience as if you were. How do you feel like living abroad has changed you? Uh, I think I'm far more open and empathetic, possibly to different cultures, different people. You're more understanding of others. Because when you immerse yourself into a different culture, you really have to leave your pride at the door. It's a humbling experience to go from being educated and well-respected in your community to moving to a place where you can't speak the language and you can't help but feel a little bit dumb because you can't express yourself. And I think that if everyone had to do that and then go back to the country they were born from, the world would be a different place because you can't help but have a different global view. I've been in the, a taxi in Canada where you start striking up a conversation with a driver and then you find out that while well, in his country, he was a doctor and now he's driving a taxi in whatever city in Canada. Well, I understand that because you have to recreate your life and it might not be the same life that you created the first time. So how do you feel when you return to Canada after being gone for a while? Well, I've been gone from Canada for a long time. So sometimes I feel a little bit like an outsider in my own country only because like I said earlier, when I left Canada, I had a flip phone that had no internet on it. And I was texting by pressing all the buttons three times in a row. Like that was a long time ago in that aspect. So the shows on TV, the way some of the language that people use, the, the short forms like OMG and things like that, people are talking. I, I don't know what they're saying. I feel like a foreigner mm -hmm. at home, but in other ways, it's still home. My family's there. That's where I grew up. I, it's, um, it'll always be that feeling of coming home. When I lived in India and in Germany, I was very aware of my foreignness on a day-to-day -day basis, even as I integrated into those cultures. But only in India did I really sense that I was an expat or a foreigner. I'm also interested in hearing about how you living in an Indonesia where you are an obvious foreigner and a privileged one just because you're coming from a Western culture to a different culture. Is, is that really different for you than being able to blend in in France or in Europe? Yes. Were you able to blend in in France? For the most part in France, there's, there's certain things like that people in France don't generally, maybe it's changing a little bit now, but if your hair's brown, your hair stays brown. If your hair's curly, it stays curly. If it's straight, it stays straight. They don't tend to do themselves up as much. It's more of an understated beauty. And so when I first got to France, my hair's poker straight. I would, my hair was highlighted blonde and I would put it in big, like I'd curl my hair when I went out and lots of makeup. And I later realized that that, that made me look like a tourist or an expat. But for the most part, I could go out and blend in unless I opened my mouth and started talking and then people knew I wasn't from there. But here in Indonesia, 
I'm immediately not from here. I'm immediately an expat and so are my children. And that has been very different. We've experienced that traveling before, but we've never experienced that continually on a day-to-day basis. And I have, the thought has crossed my mind that it's the first time or probably the closest we'll ever get to being celebrities or how celebrities would feel. Because even if I'm just walking down the street, people point and stare and my kids get touched and hugged and kissed and people want to take their picture. And my youngest daughter, who's only two, she just walks down the street and waves to people now, generally speaking, which is a very strange thing to do. Oh, cute. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing. And I do feel lucky to be born in Canada and to have access to education and things like that. But really, it's only luck. And as an expat, you learn that people are people no matter where they live or how they grew up, once you get to know them, you can appreciate that. And all the other things sort of fall to the wayside. And being an expat gives you good insight into that. Now, the name of this show is The Global Mom Show. And I have my own definition of what that means. But I like hearing from others about their definitions. Lisa, what do you think? when you hear the words global mom? I think of moms all over the world, whether they're moms like myself who are living in a country other than their own or moms from Germany, moms from Australia, moms from Singapore. A global mom, in my mind, is just moms from all over the world. And... I think it's kind of interesting to find out how people do things in different countries with their children, raising their kids. Yeah. That's one of the things I really want to do with this podcast is just showcase all the different moms around the world and the different ways that they are bringing up their kids to learn about other cultures, to connect with one another and to live in a way that respects the diversity and uniqueness of people and cultures all across the globe. So that's my definition of a global mom is someone who loves to learn about other cultures and connect with the world around her. What do you hope your girls will gain out of these life experiences of living abroad and traveling abroad? Well, kind of along the lines of what I just said, um, the experience we get as being expats, I hope that they'll realize that they're the same as a little girl who grew up in India. And we see that when we're traveling with our kids, because if we're sitting in a square somewhere having a bite to eat, and there's two kids that are from completely opposite sides of the world and they're playing, they don't need to speak the same language. They both just like playing. So what we're trying to instill in our kids is that it doesn't matter where you come from or what you have or don't have people are just people. They just live in different places and they might have a different color skin, but that doesn't really matter. Thanks for answering all the deeper questions. And now I'd like to have some fun and ask you a series of short questions that you can answer with some short and sweet answers. Are you ready for that? I hope so. Okay. What is your favorite place to travel with kids? Italy. What is the worst cultural faux pas you've made? (laughs) <laughs> asking for a wine list in a Muslim country. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite food in your current country? Mangoes. Oh, I love <laughs> mangoes. And you have not had mangoes and out of until you're out of North America. They're, That's all they're I can amazing. Say. They're, it's... Asian mangoes, Indian mangoes are the best. Anyway. <laughs> What is your top airplane tip for traveling with toddlers? Bring a change of clothes and lots of baby wipes. Which airport do you love the most and why? The airport in Amsterdam because they actually have a room with pods and cribs in it that you can separate and you can put your kids for a nap. Oh, cool. I have never. It's amazing. Street food, yes or no? 
Before kids, yes. After kids, no. What is your favorite word to say in French? If you asked my daughter, she'd probably say "arrête," which is stop. <laughs> but I think my favorite <laughs> word is "ouh la la," and just all the different ways that the French say it because it means a different thing every time. That's fun. If someone gave you two hundred thousand flight miles that had to be used tomorrow, where would you go and why? I think I would go to somewhere like Bora Bora or Tahiti because it's just so expensive once you get there that you need to have a free flight. And for the last question, I'm going to sort of lead you in this one and remind you of a blog post of yours. What is your funniest cultural misunderstanding having to do with a massage in France? <laughs> uh, or, or manicure? Are you talking about a manicure? A manicure. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> well, that ended up kind of different. Okay. So when I was living in France, I went with my girlfriends to the spa and I was pregnant at the time. So they were all going for massages, but there was no pregnancy table. So I thought that I would get a manicure instead. So we were having some time out by the pool beforehand and having coffee and breakfast. And then when it was my turn to be called into the spa, I walked past one of my friends who was also getting a manicure and the lady brought me into the back room and she gave me the little disposable underwear and she asked me to put them on. And I said, oh, in French, I told her there must be a misunderstanding. I'm here to get my nails done. And she said, yeah, yeah, put this on. And again, it was in my earlier time in France, in France. So my French wasn't that great. And I tried to explain it to her again, je suis ici pour mes angles, I'm here for my nails. She said, oui, 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 je sais. And she told me to put them on. So I thought, okay. So she left the room or she went, turned around and did something else. And I just put them on. And then she ended up taking my robe from me and I was standing there naked except for these little disposable underwear and I was just there to get my nails done. And I had no idea why she was doing this. And I didn't know, I didn't have the language to actually sort out the problem. So I just went along with it. And I got a manicure done to my nails, being almost completely naked the entire time. And I, to this day, I still have no idea why. <laughs> and you were laying on a massage table yes. just in a back room. Somewhere. Exactly. I was laying down on a massage That's table getting my nails done while not wearing my clothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is pretty funny story about about the massage and manicure. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today on the Global Mom Show. I look forward to staying connected with you. And if you want to connect with Lisa, you can find her at CanadianExpatMom.com. And you can find me on Facebook under Lisa Webb, Canadian expat mom. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. I'm Mary Grace Otis, and you can find me and all the show notes and information about our guests at theglobalmom.com. You can also connect with me on Facebook at The Global Mom Show. I'm so glad you took the time to listen in to my conversation with Lisa today. If you like what you heard and you'd like to hear more, take a second right now to click on iTunes and subscribe to the show. Each week, I'll be posting a new episode, and when you subscribe, the new episode will automatically appear in your podcast app, so you won't miss it. And the way iTunes works, subscribing actually makes it easier for others to find The Global Mom Show as well, and if you take an extra few minutes and leave a review, that makes a huge difference in how many people will have the opportunity to find the show. So head over to iTunes and do that real quick right now. Thanks a lot. Have a great week, and remember... You can live a global life wherever you are and teach your kids to do the same.